Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is a lesson, a series of lessons on the book of Job. It's for the months of October, November, and December of 2016. And this is lesson number seven in that series for November 12 of 2016. This is going to be a very challenging lesson. At least in my opinion, it's a very challenging lesson. So I would like to ask you, along with us, to bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, help us to understand this challenging subject of retributive justice, retributive punishment. What does that mean? Do we understand it? Do we have a clear picture of how it plays out in the Bible? May we understand what we have a chance to study today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I would like to just say up front that there are a lot of things that have happened to our world that are impossible to explain logically without an understanding of the great controversy. So people have tried again and again to explain the causes of evil with little success. Uh, Many of you probably know about the book that was written not too many years ago, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Well, it wasn't a very good explanation, I don't think. So what is the cause of human suffering? Now, many people think that the book of Job is primarily about why humans suffer. Is it really? What else could it be? Yeah, exactly. Well, well in, in 10 seconds, tell us. <laughs> well, Just in case. The, the book is going to try to suggest that, I mean, our Bible study lessons about the book is going to try to tell us that this gives us God's perspective on suffering. I would like to suggest that this gives us a perspective on what Satan would do if he were given a free hand causing suffering on this earth. So you can see what you think about that. Well, we're going to look at two chapters today. I'm going to read you the first one right now, Job 8. This is Bildad's speech. Remember, we had Eliphaz, we had Bildad, and we had Zophar. So Bildad said, are you finally through? And this is responding to Job's response. Job responds to to, uh, Eliphaz, and now Bildad is going to respond to Job. Are you finally through with your windy speech? God never twists justice. He never fails to do what is right. What did he mean by that? He punishes evil. And he rewards righteousness, right? Your children must have sinned against God, and so he punished them as they deserved. Did he have any, any, even the tiniest little bit of evidence for that statement? Yes, it happened. (laughs) He had the wisdom of the of the theologians of the day and our day. Turn now, he says, and plead with Almighty God if you are so honest and pure, then God will come and help you and restore your household your household as your reward. Now I hope he came back when Job was a rich set was twice as rich and said, God has blessed you. All the wealth you lost will be nothing compared with what God will give you then. That was pretty much right, wasn't he? Look for a moment at ancient wisdom. So what's he going back to here? The elders know that this is true. So, Job, what's wrong with you? Why can't you figure it out? Consider the truths our ancestors learned. Our life is short. We know nothing at all. We pass like shadows across the earth. But let the wise ancestors teach you. Listen to what they have, they had to say. Reeds can't grow where there's no water. They are never found outside a swamp. If the water dries up and they are the first to wither, while still too small to be cut and used, godless men are like those reeds. Their hope is gone. Once God is forgotten, they trust a thread, a spider's web. If they lean on a web, will it hold them up? If they grab for a thread, will it help them stand? So what's he saying here? Job, we just take one look at you, and we know that you've done, you must have done a whole bunch of bad things, right? The wicked sprouts like, the wicked sprout like weeds in the sun. 
like weeds that spread all through the garden. Their roots wrap round the stones and hold fast to every rock, but then pull them up. No one will ever know that they, they were there. Yes, that's all the joy wicked people have. Others now come and take their places. So his idea is, okay, Job, you're about to be gone, and nobody's going to remember you because of the wickedness you've done. So you better repent really fast because God's about to uproot you and throw you on the dung heap, right? But God will never abandon the faithful or even ever give help to evil people. He will let you laugh and shout again, but he will bring disgrace on those who hate you and the homes of the wicked will vanish. So what's he trying to say? Something, if something bad has happened to you, it's because you're evil. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're good, God will bless you with wealth and health. So therefore, Job, you are personally responsible for the death of your, the deaths of your ten children. What a joyous message. Yeah. To use the vernacular, get your act together. Mm -hmm. Well, what else would he say? Well, did he have to say anything at all? He didn't for the first well, seven if days. He, if he believed that was the truth, would he hold it back? Would anybody well, hold no, it back? He, he thought he was speaking the truth from God. He really thought so. Well, it kind of sounds, looks like everybody would have said that. Well, Maybe this is the reason why Job was so unique, because he actually thought that people, just because people suffer doesn't mean that, that they, they were sinned. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was the only one in the whole world that knew that. You never know. Well, imagine, here's a man who's, who's, who's weeping because he's lost everything. He's lost his children. His wife is about to say, curse God. But wife has already said, curse God and die. And you come up and said, oh, you must be responsible for the death of your children. I mean, how would you feel? That would tell me that when we're in heaven, we're seeing all these sinners weeping and and going to, that there's bad things happening because of their choices, mm -hmm. that we should just be quiet. Let well, it happen. Let's just let's just speculate for a moment, hypothesize. Would these men, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, would they have dared to say what they said if they had known Job 1 and 2. Well, I don't uh, know uh, why you asked that. Because I want, I want they didn't. To, yeah, they I, didn't I, know I understand that. that. I'm just asking. If they had known, would they have dared to say that? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. But the point is that they, they didn't. didn't know. I agree. And if you don't know, it might as well not have happened. Yeah, that's true. Well, but what they, what they did then, not knowing... Because they didn't know what the truth was. We know what the truth was from Job 1 and 2. They did not know the truth, and so forth. therefore they assumed evil. So are we superior because we know 1 and 2? Well, in terms of understanding the book of Job, we certainly are. But there's, that's because we're living here, but we're not living back then. Mm -hmm. Well, these friends of Job make a number of statements about God's sovereignty, and, and they're correct. The devil never gives a total, complete dose of, of evil. He always mixes in as much truth as he can get away with. Like in the temptation of Jesus sure. uh, in uh, Matthew 4 and such. He quotes scripture, but he leaves out a little bit. And yeah. of course, Jesus comes back with another scripture that you shouldn't tempt the Lord your God. Yeah. So uh, he mis the Satan was misusing it. Okay, our lesson is entitled Retributive Punishment. What is that? You're getting to read it, or <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I thought. <laughs> well, you know, I better. I before I jump into this, I had to actually look it up. Collins English Dictionary: the act of punishing or taking vengeance for wrongdoing, sin, or injury. Punishment or vengeance. You're getting what's coming to you. Mm -hmm. Does God ever do that? 
Does he do it in anger? Does he punish? Well, when God destroys a nation, we're, we're using in quotes here, when God destroys a nation like the northern kingdom of Israel, what does the Bible say about it? He Hosea 4, 17, what? He let them go. The people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. And how does God feel about it? This is really important. How does God feel about letting his children go? Later in that same book, Hosea 11, 7 to 9, they insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. But how can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever treat you as I did Adma or treat you as I did Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim were two small towns connected with Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. I will not punish you in my anger. I will not destroy Israel again. For I am the God and not a human. I am God and not a human being. I, the Holy One, am with you. I will not come to you in anger. And yet, what happened to the northern kingdom of Israel about ten years later? God had to just back off because they were so far gone that He had to allow the Assyrians to come and conquer them. So he did let them go. He let them go. It didn't say that um, he didn't ever want to? Well, he didn't want to. They insisted. How could I? That made their choice. Was there a way that he could? Well, and that's a, that's a fair question. Does God have to finally give up on us? He has to allow freedom. Yeah. And if he allows freedom, he can't, well, he has to let us go if we insist on going away. Mm -hmm. Well, our lesson suggests that there are ditches on both sides of the road. When dealing with sin, how can we balance justice, law, and obedience with forgiveness, grace, and substitution? Are these two ditches on either side of the road? If we're following the example of Jesus, we should always err on the side of grace and forgiveness. Well, let's look at our let's look at our next speaker. And now we're going to look at Zophar, Job 11, 7 and 9. Can you discover the limits and bounds of the greatness and power of God? The sky is no limit for God, but it lies beyond your reach. God knows the world of the dead, but you do not know it. God's greatness is broader than the earth, wider than the sea. If God arrests you and brings you to trial, who is there to stop him? God knows which people are worthless. He sees all their evil deeds. Stupid people will start being wise when the wild donkeys are born tame. Put your heart right, Job. Reach out to God. How would that make you feel? What is Zophar trying to say to us in these verses? He's not questioning God's sovereignty, is he? God can do it. Does that justify the words that he, 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 says, he, he says against Job? Would any of us have a problem with saying, okay, we can search our whole lives and we can go to heaven and keep searching. We will never completely comprehend God. Would, would you all agree with that? Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're, we're never going to be able to fully comprehend God. Well, can you clearly point out what is right and what is wrong with Zophar's speech? Was Job being punished less than he deserved? We need to go back and look at that. Look at, look at this, this chapter. Uh, back up here. Job 11, verse 6. He would tell you that there are many sides to how, how I wish God would answer you. So he, Now, what's he saying? I'm speaking for God, but I, I wish he would speak for himself. And what would he say? He would tell you that there are many sides to wisdom. There are things too deep for human knowledge. God is punishing you less than you deserve. Does God really punish I guess that's, no. the, that's the presumption of the 
less entitled, isn't it? He yeah. Punishes. Okay. Well, as Seventh day Adventists, we have more evidence about the character of God than any group that has lived in history. Does that make us the best representatives of God who ever lived? Who've ever lived? It should, but often doesn't. Well, knowledge doesn't, correct knowledge doesn't necessarily produce cr correct behavior. Mm. That's too bad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, how did Christ respond when he was accused by others? How did he respond to the city of Jerusalem? Well, here's a some few words from Desire of Ages, page 353. Christ himself did not suppress one word of truth. So he spoke the truth, but he spoke it always in love. He exercised the greatest tact. Do you think that Eliphaz and Bildad and so far were exer exercising great tact? No. No. And thoughtful, kind attention in his intercourse with the people. Jesus, that's he, was never rude never needlessly, needlessly spoke a severe word, uh, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. What did that sound like? Tears were in his voice. Where did that come from, that saying come from? You say it a lot. But I don't know, where did it come from? Well, I'm reading it to you from Desire of Ages. Yes, this is right. Well, where did she get it? Presumably from the angels. The angels were on her side and telling her that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, he wept, this is Jesus again, he wept over Jerusalem, the city he loved that refused to receive him the way, the truth, and the life. They rejected him, the Savior, but he regarded them with pitying tenderness and sorrow so deep that it broke his heart. Every soul was precious in his eyes. While he was away, while he always bore himself with di divine dignity, he bowed with tenderest regard to every member of the family of God. And all men he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. This thing about, it, you go through, think about going through some of the wickedest parts of the cities in America today and saying every one of those people out there who may be, people who may be pointing a gun at you, and you're saying, I'm here to save you, brother. Okay, so in light of what we know so far about the book of Job, do you think that Job's three friends were true worshipers of the true God? Where did they get their information? So remember, there was no Bible. There were no pastors. There were no prophets that we know about. There could have been some prophets that we don't know anything about. So where did they get the information? Did they know about the flood? Probably. More than likely, Probably, since yeah. every, yeah. every civilization, civilization has a story. Yeah. <laughs> so they must have known something about this flood. Do you think it's possible they knew something about Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah. More than likely. Remember, that was in the days of Abraham. Okay, so what's your point on that? Well, I mean, what are they saying? The flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, it looks like God is zapping the wicked, isn't it? Well, you asked them where they got the information. You're, yeah. Isn't that a valid place to get the information from? Sure. I made it, you were sounding like it was coming from a wrong place. I'm, I'm, I want to, I'm laying all the evidence out there. I'm, I want to, we're going to come to a conclusion, I hope. Okay? Well, look at Genesis 6, verse 8. But the Lord was pleased with Noah. Look at these words from Ellen White. Every hammer blow struck upon the ark was preaching to the people. What do you think that means? It means something was really going to happen. Demonstrating yep. faith that God would do what he said he was going to do. Do you think the people in Noah's day believed what Noah said, but they just didn't want to accept it, or they, they thought he was being crazy? Hard to tell. 
Probably some of both. Mm. So now let's now ask the question, which is really the question of this lesson. Does God punish sinners in a form of retributive judgment? Let's look at some verses. Look at Genesis 13, verse 13. These are the, the verses suggested by our Bible study guide. Whose people were wicked and sinned against the Lord. This is talking about um, the people of Sodom. Okay? 18, Genesis 18, 20 to 22. Then the Lord said to Abraham, There are terrible accusations against Sodom and Gomorrah, and their sin is very great. I must go down to find out whether or not the accusations which I have heard are true. What does that say to us about God? His reporting system isn't too good? Well, it's interesting. They have to go down there like a human to go see mm -hmm. when he already knows what's going on. Why would he say that? Well, obviously he's testing Abraham, isn't he? Maybe he's showing the rest of the universe that, look, I, I really do know what's going on. I've been there. Mm -hmm. Well, suddenly the Lord, talking about a retributive justice now, suddenly the Lord rained burning sulfur on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them and the whole valley along with all the people there and everything that grew on the land. But, the, but Lot's wife looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. So how would, you, well, how would you describe the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's wife? Did God do that? Well, they were told to get out and don't waste time. And she, and, uh, she had to have one last look, which would seem to me to indicate that she didn't, she was sad to leave. What? I think it's pretty confusing myself. The story of, of Lot's wife? No, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh. Because Jesus said that, you know, if he, people got the information that these people that he's talking to did, well then Sodom and Gomorrah would have would repented. Would still be there. Would still be there. And then, remember, um, God asked the angels as they were going off, should I tell Abraham what I'm going to do mm -hmm. as if if I tell him you know how's it going to sound to him mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of things that are not clear cut here okay let's be very honest if we're going to take the scriptures as they read we must admit that God put to death many people in the Old Testament all of these deaths were however let's be honest the first death Remember that from God's point of view, the first death is nothing more than an extended sleep. Think of the people killed by God in the flood. Sodom and Gomorrah, the firstborn in Egypt, Nadab and Abihu, Korah, Dathan and Abiram, Uzzah, the 185,000 Assyrians, etc. We must remember that God will resurrect every one of them, every single one of them, either at the second coming or at the third coming. So is this at the end of their lives? No. So are you implying that some of the, I think you're saying straightforward, that some of these people may be saved? Potentially. What I'm saying is, if the, I mean, would you say, could you honestly say that there was not a single child, innocent child, who was drowned in the flood? Was there not a single innocent babe who, who was destroyed among the firstborn in Egypt? I don't think we can say that. Or in Sodom and Gomorrah. Or in Sodom and Gomorrah. So I quote John 5, 28 and 29. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live. Those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. Now one of the interesting points about that is when do the, when do the righteous rise? Second coming. At the second coming. When do the wicked rise? Third coming. Third. So there's a thousand, a thousand years between in the middle of that sentence. Did God bother to tell John that there was a thousand years in there? Not nope. at that time. Not at that time. He did later, didn't he? But John is the only one who knew it. 
He didn't tell Paul, as far as we can know. As far as we know, he didn't tell Peter. He didn't tell any of those other people. None of the people in the Old Testament. Well, I would say there is no way that a person reading the Scriptures honestly can believe that God was not directly involved in each of the deaths just mentioned. Uh, the example, obviously, of Numbers 16. What happened to Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Or earth opened up. Yeah. They're standing there and all of a sudden, poof, poof. Yeah. No I mean, are we going to say that was an earthquake? I mean, what explanation can you give for that except that God did it? If huh. it was an earthquake, God still did it. Yeah. And the flood and the firstborn in Egypt. I mean, you know. Well, is divine retribution essential to your understanding of the gospel? Why or why not? <coughs> now, there are friends, I can tell you, there are Christians who say, if God doesn't torture my enemies as much as they deserve, I'm not going to trust him. What's the point? Vengeance. What's the point? <laughs> Retributive punishment. What's the point? <laughs> if people are going to die, what, well, what is, what you good want, is you the don't punishment? Want to, you don't want them to... You remember the, the time when, was it Bundy? The, the absolute, absolutely horror guy that lived in Chicago and killed out how many people and eating parts of their bodies and all that, whatever all he was doing there. And what did the people come out when, it, when he finally was was put in the electric chair, what did they say? Burn, Bundy, burn. Burn, Bundy, burn. Why did they want him to burn? Rich. They weren't very forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> no, they weren't That's very sure. forgiving. They were angry because of what Bundy had done to their friends and their relatives. Right? Okay. You have a question in the hand. Does every evil deed need to be punished? Yeah. And, God, and does God do it? Mm-hmm. So, Base, basic question in, in all mm -hmm. of this. Da, is divine retribution essential to your understanding of the gospel? Why or why not? And I mean, what about the people who believe in the eternally burning hell? What's their understanding of that? Yeah. They deserve it, right? If the soul is immortal, mm -hmm. then it and it, and you can't go to, and you, you're not going to go to heaven. Then you have to burn in hell forever. So, two, two wrongs. Mm -hmm. In this case, they don't make a right. Yeah. Well, look at Deuteronomy six twenty four and twenty five. Then the Lord our God commanded us to obey all these laws and to honor Him. If we do, He will always watch over our nation and keep it prosperous. If we faithfully obey everything that God has commanded us, He will be pleased with us. Doesn't that sound pretty clear? If, well, look at, if we do what's right, God will bless us. If we don't, God will curse us and we'll be diseased and read, poor. And that's exactly what Job's friends thought. You read the last four or five chapters of Deuteronomy and it's again and again, huh? Look at 1 Samuel 12, verse 15. But if you do not listen to the Lord, but disobey His commands, He will be against you and your king. And we just, they were just about to anoint their first king. Well, there's a lot of other passages in Scripture which we've already mentioned. And I, I mentioned already Corridithan and Byram and Numbers 16. What happened? The, 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 the King James Version says their punishment is described as God creating a new thing. I mean, how many people, other people, do you know anybody else who was destroyed because the earth opened up and swallowed them and they closed on top of them? Have you ever heard of that happening to anybody? We just, we hear from time to time, we hear stories about earthquakes. But is there any, any evidence that people just, the earth opens up right underneath them they go down and then they're swallowed. Well, there's a lot of metaphorical <laughs> mm. ideas coming from that. It's interesting, however, that 
how many of Korah's children were killed? None. Look at Numbers 26, verse 11. But the sons of Korah were not killed. Why not? They weren't a part of the rebellion. They were mature people, and they were not a part of the rebellion. So God punished these people. God took their lives as an example, but didn't kill the children. But well, in, a, in a number of other instances, the children were killed, probably because they were a part of the Probably. We uh, think of, of Achan scheme. and so forth, yeah. yeah. Well, look at Revelation 20, verse 14. Then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be defeated will be death. And what about 2 Peter 3, 5 to 7? They purposely ignore the fact that long ago, God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water and by water. And it was also by water, the water of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. Does that sound like retributive judgment? Well, try these words from Ellen White. Fire comes down. This is talking about the final act on, on, on planet Earth here before God cleans up the mess and, and makes a new heaven and a new earth. Fire comes down from God out of heaven. The earth is broken up. The weapons concealed in its depths are drawn forth. Devouring flames burst from every yawning chasm. The very rocks are on fire. The day has come that shall burn as an oven. Of course, that's quoted from Malachi 4. The elements that the elements melt with fervent heat. That comes from 2 Peter 3. The earth also and the works that are therein are burned up. More of more 2 Peter 3. The earth's surface seems one molten mass, a vast seething lake of fire. It is the time of the judgment and perdition of ungodly men, the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Isaiah 34, 8, and other passages. Great controversy there, pages 672 and 673. But we mustn't forget, as we read those kind of passages, we mustn't forget Isaiah 66, 23, and 24, which says, On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Now, we Adventists love to quote that passage. For what reason? Sabbath. Yeah. We say this is proof that we will continue to worship on the Sabbath in the new earth, right? And we don't want you to read verse 24, but what I want you to read now is verse 24. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sight of them will be disgusting to the whole human race. Now, there's lots of issues there, and wish we had time to talk about, you know, what, what is this worm and what is this fire that never goes out. But the point, the point I need to make right now is, what is it that's burning? Dead bodies. Dead bodies. I want you to think about this for a moment. If God, in fact, is going to operate some kind of hell, short-term, long-term, whatever, he has to do one of two things. Because... It says there in, in 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 3, that the, the fire that he's going to send will do what? Melt the elements. What, what is another word for melting the elements? Nuclear reaction. That's a nuclear explosion. How long do, would a person survive in face of a nuclear explosion? Instantly we're gone. We would just, pfft, we would never even have a chance to feel pain or anything. We'd just be gone. So if God is going to punish the wicked, retributive justice, he has to do one of two things. He has to either wrap them in asbestos or some kind of whatever that will somehow preserve them so they can withstand this terrible heat, or else he has to turn down his fire 
and make it just hot enough so they suffer but are not destroyed. Can you imagine God doing either one of those things? No. No. And yet that's what people, people say that he does. Yep. You kind of describe in that pretty physically. Yeah. Is that is that what it's that's supposed what, to do? That's what because the wicked, that's what the uh, that's but, what. But but aren't describe. people going to heaven too during the time when the the elements are melting? Well, the time when the elements are melting will be at the third coming. The 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 city of of the New Jerusalem will be floating in the sky somewhere above oh, this I sea Paul of fire. Wrote that. B about the melt, the elements melting. Peter, or Peter. Peter. Yeah. Okay. So. So he was talking about the third coming. Third coming. When? When other? What other time well, is? Well, I it? thought I thought he was talking about the second coming. I no evidence that I've ever seen suggests that the elements will melt. The elements melting with fervent heat is when God is making a new heaven and a new earth. The new earth doesn't come till the third coming. At least that's, that's been always my understanding. Okay, well. While it is true that all suffering has come as a result of sin, it is not true that all suffering is a punishment from God. It certainly was not the case with Job unless you say that God's allowing the punishment makes him responsible. To what degree does suffering in our world represent that fact? Is it possible to distinguish between a punishment that God sends as a form of retribution from punishment which God allows? If so, how would you do that? How would you describe, how would you differentiate between the two? Is there any... Can you even differentiate? Is, is there any such thing as the former, a punishment sent by God? Well, he will... Uh, there, there is, he does, you know, in the first death, destroy people. Mm -hmm. Sodom and Gomorrah. 185,000 Assyrians. Etc. In Proverbs um, 17, it says, 11, a rebellious man seeks only evil, so a cruel messenger will be sent against him. So if we don't listen to the, the pleadings of God, then he will do other means to get our attention, uh, to try to s get us to turn back from our, our evil ways. Yeah. He sent the uh, Israel into Babylon and, and such too. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of got their attention. <laughs> yeah. And they, uh, many repented of it. Well, we need to remember that the best way to understand biblical stories is to try our level best to put ourselves back in their situation as far as possible. Could you possibly say to someone who's suffering like Job was suffering, what Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar said to him. Job's, Job looks, it looks like Job is dying, right? Yeah. Well, Ellen White comments about suffering, who she had plenty of it herself. This is SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 3, page 1140, paragraph 5. It is very natural for human beings to think that great calamities are a sure index of great crimes and enormous sins. But, but men often make a mistake in thus measuring character. We are not living in the time of retributive judgment. Good and evil are mingled and calamities come upon all. Sometimes men do pass the boundary of line, boundary line beyond God's protecting care. And then Satan exercises his power upon them and God does not interpose. Job was sorely afflicted, and his friends sought to make him acknowledge that his suffering was the result of sin and cause him to feel un under condemnation. They represented his case as that of a great sinner, but the Lord rebuked them for their judgment of his faithful servant. So, aren't there a lot of cases where it seems like someone suffers or even dies as a direct result of his own behavior? Can you think of some examples? There's a smoker who dies of lung disease, lung cancer, or, or even heart disease. There are drunks who end up killing themselves in auto accidents. But there are also a lot of other times when we don't know exactly why things have happened. 
Are there examples? Can you think of some apparently good people, like the case of Job, who suffered terribly? There are even perfectly good people who have never smoked a day in their life who die of lung cancer. How did that happen? So, now, what are we going to say about the retributive judgments of God? Is God, does God lose his temper when he sees people just continually sinning and he just zaps them? Just about everything we've read and studied in the Bible, he gives warnings. Mm -hmm. More often than not, they're warned before it comes. Yeah. Many times. So are you saying that that, that word, attributive, mm -hmm. is is legitimate? It sounds like you're, we're trying to defend it. I, I am trying to ask us if we understand it correctly, do we think it applies to God? I'll give a two-letter answer, no. Okay. <laughs> so what will happen in the final day of judgment, the third coming of Christ? Is God going to destroy all the wicked in some form of retributive punishment? Once again, I'll say no. Well, okay, now I'm going to say, where's your evidence? Philippians 2. Okay, here's a start. Philippians 2, 10 and 11, talking about the experience of Christ. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Does that include Satan? What did it say? All beings. All beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below. They have to include Satan. Yeah, they created beings. So what would cause Satan to bow on his knees and say, God, you are right? That's a tough one, Where huh? Where do you... I'm going back to your premise there. Okay. What, what point do you think they're bowing their knees? Is it before, is it before the judgment and everybody and people okay. are dead? Or is it after? No, I, I, I believe, and this is based largely on writings from Ellen White, that, uh, and, and this would be a great controversy somewhere about 662 to about 670, if you want to read the past, the place. I believe that what's going to happen, Jesus and the pe his people are going to come down from heaven. They're going to be followed by... This is the at new, the third coming. This at the third coming. They're going to be followed by the new Jerusalem. <clears throat> They're going to be able to mix with the people out there who are, have been resurrected by God at the third coming, the wicked. Then the righteous are going to go into the city and the gates are going to be shut. Then Satan is going to say to all those people out there, okay, you see this city? All we have to do is attack it. There's more of us out here than there are in there. I don't know what all his arguments are going to be, but he's going to say, we need to get inside there and get to the tree of life, and we can all live forever. We can do it. So they surround the city, and they're just about to attack it. When what does God do? He lifts the city up above, so above the, the surface of the earth so they can't get to it. And then above that, even above that, we're told that Jesus will be lifted up high on a throne and crowned as the, as the prince of this world. And then God will look out to all these evil people, the wicked, and everybody will be there. And that's when I think this will happen. And God will say, then he'll show a panorama. He's going to show the story of the, the plan of salvation from the beginning, from the point where Satan rebelled in heaven all the way through to that point in history. And when that, that I mean, I'm going to say to you that I believe that we're going to see that history in 3D living color. Steven Spielberg is going to turn green. God is going to produce a production like nothing that's ever been seen. Nothing. And it'll be absolutely true. There won't be any, no falsehood, no you know, Hollywood stuff in there. It'll be the true story of the great controversy. And it will be so compelling that even Satan himself will be down on his knees saying, God, 
you did it right. And then he gets... Then he jumps up and says, what am I doing? Let's attack the city. And at that point in time, the other wicked realize that he's the one who's caused them trouble, and they'll turn on him. And they'll turn on other people who have misled them down through the years. And they'll start fighting each other and... So this bowing down is not sincere to some people. Is not what? Sincere. The bowing no. down. Well then, he, he, why would, if it's not sincere, why would he snap out of it and then go and, and do all this stuff? Have you ever been to a movie where you were, you were brought to tears? I know all about movies. Okay. I studied them. Okay. So I, I, I'm not quite sure if a movie's going to do all that. This is going to be, like I said, this is going to be a panorama like nothing you've ever seen before. Okay compelling. The evidence is going to be so compelling that not even the devil will be able to deny it. Well, I just, I just wonder how in the world everybody can bow their knee to God sincerely and then turn around and attack him again. Well, th th there's, nothing, there's nothing logical about the devil. Absolutely nothing. He's insane. If he's he's insane, absolutely then insane. Why are we doing all this? That's the question. I think you could, if you're in the, in the wicked's case like we're talking about, I think it could be one of the very few or the last times you may well be honest and you realize what's coming you've earned. Yeah. Well, where did Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar get their understanding of God? Did they just think it up in their minds? Well, they said, uh, you know, that the ancients, the ones that came before, you know, so the things were passed down. Yeah. Okay. And there had to have been things, good things passed down, because Job had a correct understanding. You know, Abraham and, you know, some good people down through the ages had to have uh, preserved the truth. Okay. Well, I don't know. You were talking about the third coming. Mm -hmm. When did people understand about the third coming? When do you think the point well, happened after that? And if, if you give me that point, you could ask the same question about the people before the point. How come they didn't understand that? I mean, and, and that's a question we'll have to ask God someday. The people, there's no evidence that the people living in the Old Testament times had any notion that there was going to be more than one coming. And then in the New Testament, up, up until Revelation 20, there's no evidence that any of them realized there was going to be more than a second coming. Well, that's well, my point. Yeah. Job's friends, mm -hmm. <clears throat> how would they know that, you that, know, no, how would they know that if Job was punished by God that he didn't do anything wrong. How would they ever know that? Well, well you we know... Talk, it, we talked about mm -hmm. people like Abel was mm -hmm. killed. You know, he was righteous and yet he was killed. So they're examples of people yeah, who but, suffered. Yeah, but okay. they didn't, they didn't, God didn't okay. torture those people. Yeah. And they just killed them. And, well, and, and God said, the devil, don't, okay, don't I, kill him. I already suggested my answer, and you, you don't have to accept this, but this is my answer. If you really want to know what Job did, you should ask the people who live around him. I mean, you don't, you think if, so, if something, he'd done something so terrible that was responsible for what he was suffering, plus the loss of all his wealth, plus the killing of all ten of his children, somebody, I mean, how do we investigate crime in our day? Wouldn't there be somebody who knew something? It seems to me there should have been. Well, and there was nothing. My, my point is about the third coming, too, yeah. and the time before the th yeah. they believed the third coming. Mm -hmm. You would say that there's got to be something back then to tell them that there was a third coming, but you can't point to anything. No. So how do you know that you can point to anything of Job's friends that would give them a different conclusion than the one they got? Well, you, you can't from the record, but we, they should have. They, they should have said, 
we have talked to your friends, Job, the people who live around here, and they have reported to us that you did da da da. They didn't say that. They never said a word like that. Not one single word. Yeah, but the, the effect was there, though, that well, he got well, the torture. They looked at Job, the and they saw, they knew his story, and they looked at him suffering, and they just assumed, because they were so sure about that they understood what God does, they were so sure in their minds that they knew. They looked at, took one look at Job, and they said, man, you are a sinner. Well, what's wrong with that? So it's if wrong. they didn't have, if, yeah, What's I know it's wrong. It's Job, Job one and two. I know, I know it's wrong, but I think the point that people found out it's wrong is that Job showed it. Yeah, and there well, was nothing before that. Well, there must well, have Job, been because Job, Job knew it. That, though. There must have been because Job because knew it. Because he was the only one. He was he was we the special that. one. He, he says there's no one like Job, and I think it's because he knew that. Well, well we, but Job, Job you're, you're saying that the knowledge, this knowledge didn't exist before the story, but I'm saying that, that Job must speak. have known the truth about God because he expressed the truth. He That's didn't true. understand that, it. You're making my point there. I'm just mm. saying that, have you seen my servant Job? There's no one like him. Yeah. And that's the reason is because he knew that. The really sad point is what we read in our, actually in our last lesson, that the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' day accused Jesus on the same basis, and they had the evidence. Well, I'm not saying that it's going to straighten everybody out right after Job, but, but the truth became, I'm, I'm thinking that the truth became clear for the first time after Job. Well, it should have been clear. Let me read a couple. This is a passage from our Bible study guide. Bildad's speech, as recorded in Job 8, 1 to 22, responds to Job's passionate plea in defense of his innocence in Job 6 and 7. So it was a response to Job. He delivers his response in a calm and analytical way. Nevertheless, it contains almost scathing words dismissing Job's words as blustering wind. For Bildad, there's no doubt that God, A, always punishes the wicked, Job 8, 13, and B, always prospers the, prospers the righteous, Job 8, 20. In order to support his argument, he draws on logic, Job 8, 3 to 7, and tradition, Job 8, 8 to 10, and analogies from nature, Job 9, sorry, 5 to 9. As a side note, his imagery of the papyrus plant that wilts without moisture is inter interesting, Job 8, 11 to 12, given that Moses, who wrote the book of Job, was very familiar with this plant, which grew profusely in the Nile Delta in Egypt from whence he fled. Bildad's logic and acid analysis desensitized him to the suffering of Job, reducing God to a mechanical executioner of his own justice. Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 95. So Zophar goes even beyond Bildad, suggesting that God was punishing Job even less than he deserved. Look at Job 11, 5 and 6. How I wish God would answer you. He would tell you there are many sides to wisdom. There are things too deep for human knowledge. God is punishing you less than you deserve. Did he have any evidence for that? Zero. Job's three friends must have felt very strongly about their opinions. Somehow they were convinced that it was their responsibility to defend God. Now, does God need our feeble attempts to defend him? I'm trying no, he to. He doesn't, but it supports his cause when, yeah. when we do. He I'm is delighted. delighted. God is delighted when someone like Enoch or Daniel or Joseph or Job. I mean, what does he say? Job has said of me what is right. Could anything better be said about us than that? God is absolutely delighted when we correctly represent him, which is exactly the opposite of what the three friends were doing. Is it ever our responsibility to defend God's reputation? Absolutely, we ought to be doing it every day. If we are truly God's friends, shouldn't we try to defend him whenever we have an opportunity? I mean, if we want to be good Christians, what are we doing? We're representing God correctly, right? Yeah. 
<clears throat> well, there's a lot of verses in the Bible. I guess we can read a few. Uh, let's pick out Exodus. Uh, we don't have very long. Exodus 15, verse 7, in majestic triumph, you overthrow your foes. You, your anger blazes out and burns them up like straw. Well, if all you had that was that, what would you think? Look at Exodus 32, verse 10. Now, don't try to stop me. I'm angry with this. this is God speaking to Moses. I'm angry with these children of Israel. I'm going to destroy them. Then I'll make you and your descendants into a great nation. Go to the end of the Bible. Look at Revelation 18.8. 8. Because of this, in one day, she will be struck with plague. This is Babylon. Disease, grief, and famine, and she will be burnt with fire because the Lord God who judges her is mighty. Sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? Look at Job, I mean Revelation 19, verse 15. I'm going to have to cheat a little bit here. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which he will defeat the nations. He will rule over them with a rod of iron and he will trample out the wine in the winepress of the furious anger of the Almighty God. Well, these friends of Job thought they understood it. And I, I would add, this model begs, and I'm quoting from my Bible study guide, where this is going to be the end of our discussion. This model begs a set of questions. Who alone could have established such an impersonal, universal law of punishment if not God himself? Some people would say that there's a law up there that even God has to obey. And more important, what about the consistently active descriptions of God's wrath in the Bible that um, he personally enacts upon the punished? Within the great controversy, sin has originated on a personal level with Satan. The end of sin, whether it be through the direct punishments in the Bible that foreshadowed the final judgment, the final resolution of sin at the end of time, is also brought about by a personal being, a God who is actively involved in the work of salvation. And lest we forget, God's judgment always is inextricably connected to his mercy. You do what you want with this lesson, I think it's a challenge. Our kind and loving Father, with great humbleness, with a desire to know the truth, we look at these passages, we look at the scriptures, we read the things that were said to Job by his friends, and we believe that they misrepresented you. Help us not to make that mistake is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.